Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final session of the day here at Google Beach, Perspectives at Play. My name is Gemma O'Brien, and I'm an artist and designer. And I think that when I think about the overall concept for this panel, I remember back in design school when you know, you're kind of taught to disappear and be invisible and kind of take on the voice of a brand and uh, not include yourself in any way. And I think as I've gone through my career and looked at the amazing creative work that's come out and happening around me, it tends to be when people tap into something from their culture or their background or their personal experience and the team personal experience that really makes the best and most powerful creative work. So we have an amazing array of panelists today from traditional advertising, creative, an Olympic snowboarder. It's really diverse talent, and they've created some great work. So let's invite them to the stage and hear what they've worked on. Welcome. So I'll have you all introduce yourselves and just give a brief intro about what you do and who you are. Yeah. OK, so I'm uh, Laura John Van Bark. I'm Chief Creative Officer at Mr. President, which is an independent agency based in London with really with diversity at the core. So the whole way that we've created our business over the last seven years has been really putting that first. It's our competitive advantage. Uh, Ete Davies, I'm the Managing Director for Analog Folk, which is also an independent uh, digital creative agency in London. Um, I'm also the co-founder of We Are Stripes and Culture Heroes, which are two UK initiatives set up to progress the careers of people of colour across the creative industries. Kia ora, I'm Mike Davison, I'm a Creative Director at Colenso um, in Auckland, New Zealand, and I feel like I'm probably the least rare person here. I'm, uh, <laughs> um, I'm white. I'm not gay, I'm uh, middle class and pretty privileged. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you very much for having me here. I, hopefully I'll explain why I'm here. Hi, I'm Shereel Maas, a uh, professional snowboarder and yeah, from the Netherlands. And I don't think you're the only rare person here because we are all gay and all different, so it makes you rare. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, thank you so much, guys. Um, Ete, let's start with you. I mean, you're not only working in strategy, managing director, analog folk, but having, I think, started these organizations that also champion ethnic diversity. Tell us about how that's influenced maybe one particular project that's really centered around this rare concept. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess um, I was thinking about this in the flight over, and, and the project that sort of sprung to mind is particularly per, uh, pertinent given what's going on in the UK, but it's um, for the Campaign for Political Reform. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, it's a coalition set up to lobby the government for more accountability and responsibility in adverts, things like fact-checking, you know, sort of the, the important stuff. Um, and they came to Analog Folk, came into the agency, and they asked us to create a suite of uh, out-of-home and social assets to drive the message around the coalition, but also encourage people to sign up to a petition to lobby the government to demand regulation and change. Um, and obviously, we put our best people on it. And I remembered sitting in the room when we were taking the briefing, because uh, I was a client lead and helping to shape the strategy, and, and just sort of looking around. And it was just by coincidence of the team that we, we sort of put on it was um, everyone was mainly middle class, uh, digital agency, so fairly progressive, left-leaning, socialists, you know, call us what you will. Um, but this was a campaign for the public. It was to, you know, reach those people who are disenfranchised, disengaged, but, you know, were affected by politics. And, you know, my role with my experience, I grew up in, in Lewisham, southeast London, working class community, first, second generation uh, immigrants. Um, you know, a lot of poverty there. Um, and also part of my life, I grew up in Folkestone, which is you know, very white, also very working class, the sort of heart of Brexit territory, so very right wing. And, you know, those experiences with family members, with friends, understanding what those communities went through, how they felt left behind by politics, how they, as I said, were disenfranchised. But everybody wanted accountability. Everybody's active for it. And so I, I was uh, critical in, in working with the clients, working with our creative teams to make sure that the communications were relevant for everybody, not patronizing, but, but meaningful and allow people to re-engage. And do you feel like the final result really embodied that effort that you went through to ensure it kind of spoke to those different voices? Yeah, I think so. I think, it's, you know, it's, it's obviously impossible to create a message that appeals to everybody, but the, the sort of kernel of truth is people were tired of being lied to. They wanted to be talked in a, in a direct fashion. They wanted to believe what they were being told, and they wanted people to be accountable. And it was critical to make sure that that came through in a way that everybody could understand and get behind, irrelevant of, you know, whatever leaning that you had politically. 
totally. And I think that's you know, a key idea that everyone is probably experiencing within the creative advertising world is the audiences are more savvy. They know, you know yeah, when they're being advertised to and they know when they're not being spoken to. So um, I think this is perfect surreal. I'd love to hear um, you know, from your point of view so as someone who's outside, I guess, the traditional advertising world. You're not only an Olympic snowboarder, but you're a content creator. And I think, uh, what's the name of your vlog with uh, Shaka, who's also here in the audience somewhere? It's S. It's SDMA. Shark Tales. Shark Tales and Master Text. <laughs> I think the thing that I love about your vlog, I was looking at one of the videos just yesterday when you arrived in Cannes. Uh, you said, I don't know what I'm doing here in Cannes, but I think if you love what you do, who knows what will happen. So tell us a little bit how you know, your snowboarding led to this content creation. Yeah, it's kind of funny because, first of all, just coming out of the Netherlands where there's no mountains, no snow to be found, I ended up being a snowboarder. So I was like, how the hell did that happen? It just happens because I do something I love. And I've always stood behind that. And then it just gets me from one place to another. And um, first of all, I really loved making videos when I was younger. Uh, we, snow we filmed snowboard tricks. But there was not really much money involved in that for me to keep doing what I love. So I had to start writing competition as a girl. Um, for guys, there was more money involved. So having that like, setback to go like, write competitions but didn't make me as happy as just filming, um, I started like, reaching out to some other girls that would like to do the same and so me and Sharka like paired up and just kind of like tried to bring the fun back to like the snowboarding that we did have and you know you see us write the competitions and like Olympics and stuff and it's really cool but people can't really relate to that that's something you do as like top athlete but you going on holiday and having fun with your friends that's something we like to still show and you know get people involved and like get out there do the same that's what inspires us. And so do you think do you see yourself as a, as a leader and in, you know, inspiring role model, I guess, for, for another generation? Or you just feel like you're being yourself and putting it out there? I don't feel like I see myself as anything ever. Like, people call me an athlete, and I'm like, am I? I'm like, I'm eating pizza and doing the things. I'm like, not really on a strict diet or putting in the effort. Like, I just am being me, and I love what I do. And if I can inspire people in that way, that's awesome. But I never like to give myself any, any titles or anything in that sense, so... The thing is that you eat the pizza, and if you go and look at videos of what she does online, <laughs> they'll be like, oh, you're an athlete. <laughs> um, awesome. Thank you so much. So, Mike, let's hear a little bit about... There's one particular project, I think, is it entered this year in a lot of the Khan lines, but um, yeah, it tell is, us a little I, bit about it. I don't want to make this sound like a case study that I read out to you, but <laughs> it is entered here. But, um, yeah, there's some good points about it, and maybe, yeah, it explains why I am here, but... Um, yeah, it's called Kupu, and it's an app. It's a photographic app that serves up translations for the objects in the photos. Um, in my case, from New Zealand, we've got Māori population, um, a beautiful native Māori population. So this app, you can take photos of anything around you, and it gives you the Māori words for those objects. And I guess that... Um, I'll just talk about that co the collaboration that, of how that came to be. That's coming from a client that's a telco, um, very brave, that wants to engage with uh, New Zealanders, but through their heart. And I, I guess I hate this term, but the story doing, you know, doing something rather than just putting out another, um, you know, sweet promise kind of ad. Not that they do that, but, you know, that's what advertising is famous for, I guess. So a utility is something that's useful. And, I, and there's a truth in learning someone else's language um, that kind of gives you little bridges into their culture, I think. I mean, it's just word at a time. So it's not, you're not learning everything, but even understanding what the word for chair is gives you a little bit of a currency when you're in that environment, you know? So um, that's gone really well for client um, in terms of brand love, but talk a little bit more about the collaboration because it's something that um, the Google Zoo team, because they, they let us into their tech trove. They said, you know, here's some stuff that we've got. And we went, well, we want to connect with New Zealanders on bunch of different issues and anyway we, ch we chose uh, Māori language and we went great that's cool we've got a keen client and we've got the tech let's just go for it um, but what we discovered along the way and it was a big learning process um, was that you can't do something for somebody no matter how good your intent is you've got to do it with them and um, so the normal advertising process certainly in New Zealand is get in there results driven get it out get some you know get the res get the feedback back and hopefully win an award. That's kind of basically in a, in, a, in a bad way the way it goes. So 
we had to slow right down and pull in the right people to give us the right knowledge and the right st steps to make this thing be authentic so that when it was presented back to the country, back to Māori, they went, that's cool. So, um, yeah, it was a really big learning curve um, and a very slow process. It took two years to make this app, and I know that doesn't sound like much here probably, but in New Zealand that's, a, that's an ice age. Um, and there's something that just cut me off if I'm burbling on, but something that Cindy Gallup said last night on the stage, it was like, we all talk about diversity and we're all you know, promising these things and we talk about inclusion, but we've got to start actually doing it because the truth is I'm a white guy trying to do something for Māori, but where's the Māori creative in the creative department? You know, really, at the end of the day, that's the problem, really. I, mean, I love Māori culture. My kids are all Māori. I've learnt the language. My sister was uh, adopted in Māori, so I've, I've got a lot of love for the culture, but I'm not Māori. You know, and there's 15% of them make up our population, and less than 2% of them are in marketing. So, you know, you know I've, I've been listening, and it's like you, you can promise things, and I, I do definitely want to um, start trying to find a way to get more Māori kids into advertising, because you know, I think it's really scary for them. Um, it's, a, it's an industry where you have to be super resilient. You have to take a lot of knockbacks. Uh, it's not so much about creativity as much as resilience. So um, I'm working on that, but, yeah. Anyway, I think that you know a lot of you have organisations or experiences where it, it's not only about creating and being a leader that celebrates diversity, but also building that up for you know new people into the industry or people who might be a little bit scared to you know take the leap. So that's probably the perfect segue to the she says founder, uh, yeah, Laura. Absolutely. Um, can I just say that piece of work is my favourite piece of work here at Cannes this year. It's absolutely brilliant, and please, if you've not downloaded it and played with it, do because it's super wonderful um yeah so i guess my it's been sort of interesting to to bring a, as you do as well uh my work with she says which is it's the largest uh, organization to get creative women into the industry um it we're in 43 different countries uh cities rather in in 20 countries um and it's all run by volunteers and it's all sort of grown really organically but my kind of experience there sort of growing this amazing network and then my experience, I guess, of being in an agency and doing creative work and how those things combine. Um, and uh, the most amazing thing for me, actually, this year has been the privilege of working on Plan International. So they are a charity... They're known as a, like a, basically as a child sponsorship charity. So, you know, sponsor a, a child in Africa, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They realized or they understand that actually lifting women out of poverty and giving them education and giving girls and young women equal rights is the fastest way to achieve their aims and so they've moved from um moved from being a children's charity and so we've helped them sort of develop this new brand platform which is called girls get equal the incredible thing there and i was you know talking about she says and how it sort of reaches out and how we have this incredible network is um they need to run in 78 different countries and the work has to be relevant in 78 different countries. And so we worked very, very closely then with teams on the ground all over the world. Uh, we directed uh, the work remotely from London and sort of edited and what have you, the films. Um, but, you know, every... It's kind of an interesting piece of work for me because it will never win a, an award because it's so simple. The, the name Girls Get Equal, it's like a very simple... Um, uh, I guess you call it a mnemonic, you know, sort of painting the face. But it is something that each of those 78 countries has been able to take and run with on their own. And I'm a, like a massive believer in its sort of distributed creativity, really, and how powerful that is when you give people the power to actually take something that you've helped to make and, uh, and do their own thing with it. And I guess also I feel like She Says was started before it became, you know, yeah. before there was a rare it wasn't, it wasn't at, at Khan. Cool. And so what have you seen in the years of your career? Obviously, a lot has changed, but there's obviously a lot that needs to still change. And I guess this is probably a, a good question for each of you to yeah. think about the future and, you know, what, not only your role and what creative you can create, but how can rare talent really make the best work? Yeah, I mean, 100 percent, like diverse talent makes better work, like without a doubt you know, ab absolutely proven. It's sort of how you are able to kind of bring that in and foster it in your, in your own agencies. In terms of she says, um, yeah, it was very uncool. And, um, you know, the, the word feminism wasn't 
even really... Uh, it was like a dirty word, right, 12 years ago. Uh, it's wonderful now that it, uh, there are so many more conversations around it. And things are changing. You see more young women sort of coming into the industry. There used to be no women at all, even like at that lower level. You know, you have something like 60% of design and art courses uh, taken by women, and then only 38% of people in their first year of agencies are women. You go, where d where do the rest of them go? Um, but there's still, you know, as you work your way up, there's still a load of things that we need to tackle. And I think one of those is making sure that women and any, like, just diverse talent in general have a platform to show their work and being seen as creative geniuses rather than, uh, rather than being put in a box, to, to your point. Yeah, I agree with everything that um, Laura said. And, you know, particularly for uh, creative businesses, it's, it's a competitive advantage to have diversity. Well, one, through the ideas and, you know, the richness of you know, imagination, as the team said, that you get. But also being able to reach new audiences, you know, that, that bit of cultural brokerage, that's necessary to do the work that we do. Um, and th the only thing I would add is, you know, to sort of spark that change, we need more representation in, in leadership because that's where the decisions are made and that's where we start to influence, you know, our industry, our organizations and, and make them more inclusive. Great. I think it's embarrassing that we market to uh, countries and we don't reflect the makeup of the country as a number one thing. And I, I, my, my passion for that Cooper job was definitely from the heart, but I like, you know, we all were there to make money, right? I think it's the people that um, make the money that tell me if I've still got a job or not. So I do, and data is like a weird thing. I don't really, it's not really my thing, but I do like the data that says that the more creative the job, the better it will work. So if you go back one step, the more diverse the people that are inputting into that job, the more creative it will be, the better the work, the more money you make. So diversity means making money. It's not why, I, it's not what motivates me, but I think it makes it, it's an interesting point in industry, you know? Yeah, don't know what to, much to add on to this, but uh, yeah, from my perspective in snowboarding and always being a marketing tool for brands, um, before we had photo shoots and they did film shoots with us, as now we have so much power in our own hands with Instagram and Facebook and stuff. We have to do our own social media. Um, that gives us, and not just us as uh, athletes, but also especially the women in snowboarding and in the extreme sports, a bigger, better voice. Because before in extreme sports, girls were always put in, like, especially in surfing, nice bikinis, long blonde hair, and they're like, is that how everybody surfs? I don't like to go in the water and have my bikini hanging off my... <laughs> ass, <laughs> you know, and keep on surfing. But that's what they only show. It's like now we can really show our own true voice through social media and still represent the right brands that will keep backing us. So that's really cool, I think. Amazing. Time is up. But if you want to grab all of our amazing panels and have a chat later on, it's been a pleasure to have you. So thank you so much. <laughs>